Good morning, everyone. Um, wonderful to have you here in person and uh, the 260 odd people we have online with us. So welcome from wherever you are. And we're really very much looking forward to sharing this program with you, looking at reviewing the impact of long-term anoxic and hypoxic encasements at here and at the National Archives. The program uh, we will run through today will start with some introductions. I'll hand over to Jennifer, myself with some background, and then to, uh, to Andrew. So we will, I'll introduce each of those as we start. But firstly, I'd like to hand over to uh, our Director of Preservation, Jacob Nadal, to uh, welcome you all here. Uh, well, thank you all. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to see you in person. I'm glad to know we have so many people online and, and on behalf of the Library of Congress. I'm um, uh, so happy to have you here. Um, I apologize. I'm going to do the traditional um, Washington, D.C. senior level remark and run. Uh, but uh, in, in this case, I actually have read the white papers and, and had some great discussions um, uh, with Fenella and her group about them. And, and I'm so excited that this, this work is getting shared. Um, normally, uh, when I get up behind a podium like this, I make some uh, wisecrack about um, someone from D.C. in a blue blazer taking all the oxygen out of the room. Um, and, and you have also robbed me of that opportunity today. Um, uh, it's, it's really exciting to see um, all, all of this work coming together, um, the chance to look at 10 years of data on uh, what represents um, really sort of a moonshot in preservation and, and conservation um, is really gratifying. Uh, and it's gratifying to know that we do it in a context where we know these um, projects have made a difference um, from the the day-to-day -day protection of, of some truly incredible objects uh, to even what we saw at National Archives during a vandalism incident a, a while ago. Um, we, we know the value of thinking carefully about how we display and present our objects and making sure that they, they remain available. So um, I, I want to say thank you both to all of you who have been involved in doing this work. Um, it, it's a tremendous undertaking and a tremendous achievement. Um, and to all of you, um, also just for being interested in this work. Um, we, we need people to care about it um, for this work to continue. Um, and we need people to understand the value of it. Uh, so it means a great deal to us in the program to know that people are tuning in, um, that people are listening. Um, I, I think that. Um, Everybody needs an occasional moonshot in their life, um, and so I'm glad that, that uh, Library of Congress could be a part of this one. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. with every moonshot, though, I know it, it needs to come back to Earth safely, so I'm, I'm glad we have a couple hours um, of everyone's time together to take a look at the data, see what we've learned, um, and, and see what we can do from here. So uh, with that, thank you, and I'll, I'll turn it back over to Penella. Thank you, Jake. So. We think about the fact that this is fairly modern, but in fact, people were thinking about that, this going back to 1888 when they realized in fact that we could actually control some of the fading um, and reduce it when it was in, in vacuum. And there's also been attempts just from wrapping um, protective parchment around materials, heavy bindings, thinking about that reduced ex you know, exposure to the environment. And there's so many things that have changed over the years. You're going to see, you've already seen some interesting shots. You'll see a lot more images of changes in design over the time. And, and we're looking forward to, to sharing those with you. What strikes me particularly is when we look at some of the early designs, how different uh, cases have been. This is one of the early uh, work that, that the Giddy did in terms of the Royal Mummy Collection. Uh, they're no longer in these encasements. And then through to the Baptistry of St. John in Florence, uh, the, the Doors of Paradise. I remember being there in Florence once. It took me a long time to find them, but I did finally get there. Just, just stunning. Uh, but the, you can see how these are things that, particularly for very precious uh, materials and uh, collections, that they've been thought about for different perspectives. And just a very historic shot of the, the, the Charters of Freedom cases going back. Uh, you'll see some wonderful, more modern materials than this. And then a very recent one uh, from the, the Harry Ransom Centre. And so you can see that some of these, it's being used for different purposes. And that's what we'll talk about uh, a lot more about some of those purposes um, over time. So without more ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, Dr. Jennifer Herman. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce her. She's been a senior heritage scientist at the National Archives and Record Administration, specialising in answering technical and preservation questions about NARA holdings for 16 years. She works closely with conservators, 
exhibits professionals, archivists and facilities to increase access to the records while maximising their preservation for future generations. As such, she's also one of the members of the team that monitors the documents permanently displayed in the rotunda and the anoxic encasements that she'll be discussing today. Prior to her career at NARA, Jennifer worked with paper and ink at the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, as well as with the vast collections of the National Park Service at Harpers Ferry Centre. And I will, full disclosure, that was where I first met Jennifer at Harpers Ferry. It goes back a few years, so we've known each other a while. And she received a PhD in analytical chemistry from the University of Buffalo, the State University of New York. So please welcome Jennifer to the, the podium. lucky that I've known you and gotten to work with you so much. This is where I confess I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> Thank you. I'm excited to be part of the symposium. Encasements have been one method of preservation during display used at the National Archives for more than half a century. Currently, the National Archives uses this technology to permanently display several iconic objects created from iron gall ink on parchment. Here we see the Declaration of Independence, the first page of the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. Until the early 1950s, these documents were in the custody of different government agencies and exposed to poor conditions of storage, display, and transport, including secret evacuations in times of war and cross-country exhibition. The Declaration of Independence in particular suffered from excessive handling, uncontrolled environmental conditions, and exhibition at high light levels over many decades. Here you can see the difference in appearance of the ink and parchment between the Declaration, which was heavily exhibited, and the Constitution, which was not exhibited until much later. The first encasements for these documents were created in the 1950s by the National Bureau of Standards using thermopane technology. Yes, based upon window technology. This technique relied on placing the document on a cellulose backing paper on a piece of glass. A free-floating glass pane was then placed over top to allow some natural movement of the document as temperatures might fluctuate while on display. A top piece of glass was placed over the four layers to create a sandwich. The top and bottom piece of glass were then sealed with lead through a critical soldering process shown in the first picture. After this hermetical, hermetically sealing, the encasements were filled with gold-plated, were fitted, I can't read, fitted with gold-plated bronze frames depicted here for the transmittal page of the Constitution, which was, has not been displayed, but as part of the documentation of the Constitution was also placed inside of an encasement. This slide shows the instrumentation used to replace the air in the encasement with humidified helium gas. The idea was to reduce the impact of deterioration caused by chemical reactions that involve oxygen. As a note, this technology did not allow the interior environment to be sampled unless the seal was broken and the whole delicate process would need to start from scratch. The charters in their MBS encasements drew over a million visitors a year. However, by the 1980s, the charters had been in the NBS encasements for over 30 years. And although there wasn't any sign of noticeable changes to the documents, conservators were aware that the glass was beginning to deteriorate. This slide shows a crystal that formed on the glass. One step that NARA took in response to the preservation concerns was to develop the Charters Monitoring System, which was designed by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and installed in 1987. The Charters Monitoring System was a digital camera system that scanned high-resolution images of one-inch square patches at various locations on each document. The idea was to scan an image and then come back to the same location in a year or a few years to scan another image and look for signs of change. The Charter's monitoring system eventually showed that a tiny piece of ink had lifted from one patch of the transmittal page of the Constitution, but otherwise it did not detect any other ink damage. It did not allow NARA to study the, it did allow NARA to study the glass deterioration. The ratio image in the middle shows one image divided by another image taken at another time. The streaks are cracks on the glass surface. 
When the Charter's monitoring system was upgraded in 1995, we were able to collect more data, including images focusing on the glass to show the cracks and crystals. NARA then held a series of meetings and discussions, including with the Advisory Committee on Preservation. While the committee believed that the Charters were not in immediate danger, the outcome of the meeting determined that it was time to plan for new encasements and that this should happen sooner rather than later. In the process of planning to rehouse the charters, NARA hoped to address other issues with their display. For one thing, the old vault could only display two of the four Constitution pages. Pages one and four, along with the Bill of Rights, were displayed at an angle in front of the display case, while the Declaration was displayed vertically and much higher. Constitution's page, Constitution pages two and three were kept in a metal box inside the vault in front of the Declaration. At one point, a visitor complained that she was disappointed in only being able to see pages one and four on display. In response, in 1970, NARA began showing all four pages once a year from the vault. They'd be removed, and then they were put in a ter temporary exhibit in the rotunda on Constitution Day. The rotunda display also had steps that needed to be navigated to approach the charters. This made viewing difficult for visitors in wheelchairs or anyone who had problem navigating steps, even after the addition of a temporary ramp. Also, the display was fairly high a problem for children. The declaration was several feet away from the viewer, making it even harder to see the faded text. Therefore, a new renovation of the rotunda would occur at the same time as the re-encasements of the documents. Once the decision to create new encasements was made, gas extraction experiments were carried out prior to fully opening the NBS encasements. It was quite a tricky process, as illustrated here, to puncture the lead seal and remove a tiny sample of gas, keeping it uncontaminated for analysis, but making sure that a pressure differential was not created that would shatter the glass panes over top of these priceless documents. Everyone was excited to know that the lead seals and thermopane technology had held the, the helium environment and that an anoxic environment still existed in five of the encasements and a hypoxic environment in the other two after 50 years. The transmittal and page three of the Constitution, shown in red, were considered hypoxic and not anoxic by this definition. The higher than expected carbon dioxide levels are surprising and plans exist to extract a gas sample from our current encasements to see if this trend is repeated. Humidity levels were also higher than expected. However, we know that the humidity is remaining in the expected range for our new encasements because they are monitored by built-in humidity sensors. The current charters encasements were created by the National Institute for Standards and Technology, which is the new name of the National Bureau of Standards, who created the original cases. These encasements are also all metal and glass. They rely on a metal sea seal to hold an environment of humidified argon within the case. An outer indium seal creates a gap between the two metal seals that can be tested for a trace of 2% helium added as a leak marker, which was originally used to estimate the opposite increase uh, in oxygen concentration as the gases attempt to reach equilibrium by diffusing in and out of the case. Argon is heavier than oxygen or helium and should help minimize diffusion more than an inert environment created from a lighter gas. The metal C seal was hoped to give a 100-year anoxic environment. With this design, we can monitor the cases to check the seal and oxygen levels. The parchment is placed on a high-quality cellulose paper made by the University of Iowa, and this backing paper, as well as the parchment of the object, help to maintain the humidity for the document. As can be seen from this new design, any potential glass deterioration in future will not come in contact with the documents. This is a view very few people get to see of the bottom of the encasement, which allows access and monitoring with the efficient arrangement of sensors. The humidity and pressure sensors live on the encasement and are located in one pop-up, while the other pop-up is left empty, which gives us flexibility to mount and use new sensor technology as it is developed. The pop-ups and valves 
Pop-up valves and sample manifold also provide access to the interior environment for sampling experiments and connections used during the filling of the case or if new experiments would indicate that the internal environment needed to be changed. These narrow nest encasements were a breakthrough in encasement environments because of the flexibility of creating, monitoring, and changing the environments in the case without having to disassemble and stress the documents. There are a lot of connections and equipment that go into monitoring the encasements. In this photo, Charles Tilford was explaining the leak detector and turbo pump used to pull vacuum to clean and monitor the new oxygen sensor prior to attaching it to the encasement manifold, which isolates the case so that the interior environment of the encasement is not changed while analyzing the very low internal oxygen level. We are using a pico ammeter to monitor the oxygen level as the current measured is proportional to the percent oxygen inside the case. Here we can see the 1% oxygen sensor installed on the encasement to monitor page one of the Constitution. During the pandemic, we were able to measure the encasements for several days so that the sensor could get a true no-flow equilibrium reading. Most of these sensors are supposed to be used with flow, and so we're really pushing the technology to be able to monitor the internal environment. Based on this data, as well as previous data collected between musing, the museum closing on one day and opening the next day, we were able to determine the oxygen status of each encasement. The declaration, Constitution pages 1, 2, and 3, as well as the transmittal page of the Constitution are all in encasements still considered anoxic by the definition set by the project since the interiors of each of these encasements remain under half a percent of oxygen. It is suspected that page 4 has lost steel integrity since we were unable to achieve an oxygen measurement on this encasement and could not get a leak reading either. We think that the indium seal probably is no longer laying flat and that that's why we can't get the leak measurement. The Bill of Rights may be only be a little over 1% oxygen, which is as high as our sensors can monitor since we achieved about a half a percent oxygen reading in 2019, but in 2021 the sensor tripped, signifying that the oxygen level was now above 1%. We have plans to sample the gases inside the encasements to determine the concentration of other species besides oxygen. We also use low light levels to allow these documents to be on permanent display. Therefore, we keep the light levels on the documents below 20 lux, but now allow visitors to be only inches away from the documents protected behind display cases as well as inside the encasements themselves. We use all these strategies and information, plus new research, like the information we'll hear today about analyzing the documents and the interior environment of the Library of Congress cases, to continue to make the most informed preservation decisions for these important documents that we can. Continuing to research these encasements and how different preservation environments affect the objects is necessary to ensure the preservation of these icons so that generations of visitors will have access to witnessing the power these documents contain and learn from their words and continuing story. Excitingly, NARA also has plans to permanently display the Emancipation Proclamation in the rotunda, and so research is currently underway to determine the preservation display for this treasured Charters of Freedom. Thank you for your time. I also want to thank my encasement team members, Mark Ormsby, Amy Lubick, and Sarah Spargle, as well as my Library of Congress colleagues who always graciously share their encasement knowledge with us. Make sure your pencil is sharp for taking notes on their presentations coming up. If you want more details on the fascinating story of the history of these treasures, please look at the prologue articles on NARA's website. The entire NIST NARA encasement story can also be seen in the NOVA documentary titled Saving the Charters of Freedom. Thank you. Now I'll do what I should have done earlier and introduce myself. I'm Fenella France and I just wanted to give a little bit of a walk back through the history of some of the encasements at the Library of Congress. 
Some of our conservation colleagues uh, may remember the, the top treasure cases. Um, so we go back to uh, top treasure cases, the Voldsmuller and the Abel Buell map, and those are the three that I'll just talk through in, in terms of mainly the construction and background. So there was really, there's a lot of things you're going to see a number of times, and we really want to emphasise that the selecting a case or creating a case, as you have seen, is challenging. Monitoring it and trying to see what happens over time and the right materials uh, is really challenging. And I'm delighted to say we have two of our wonderful colleagues here from NIST, NIST the National Institute for Standards and Technology, and without their work uh, for both of our institutions, we could not have, have done what we've done. So some of the thoughts, in fact, um, has been, particularly here at the library, that the anoxical hypoxic um, encasements was, had been a requirement for some of our top treasures and that we needed things that were going on long-term exhibit to be controlled in a very precise way. And that's very much the case you've just heard at NARA as well. So how can we actually think about making these available but protecting them for the best that we can? As we all know, we really don't like to put things on long-term exhibit, uh, but sometimes that is uh, out of our hands and we need to work within those parameters. And as you'll see from uh, the, the next presentation, that we're really looking at how we can reduce those oxidative uh, processes, how we can uh, minimise damage to any of the uh, materials in that. Okay. Hopefully that is a bit, bit better. Can you hear me now? So it's this one. Okay, all right. I will try and get in the middle of this. So some of the issues I just want to bring up, because this is what we really want to have people thinking about, is that whole factor of the case construction and design um, that's really a critical, what materials you choose. It's, it's not always, you may not have the, the, the most amazing way to uh, do the work that we've done, um, but it may work for the length of your exhibit. How to monitor those environments, what are the actual uh, parameters that you need, and what the feasibility is for the specific collection material. Uh, I do just want to mention, and I think uh, Dr Davis will talk about that as well, but we've been working with our colleagues at National Archives and the Smithsonian to put together white papers of really thinking about what the, the best options are do you really want an exhibit? Is it best for your materials uh, for this type of encasement? And there's a copy on the page and some of the, the lovely materials over to the left there. So our top treasure cases that go back to the 1990s, uh, as I said, a little bit of a walk through history. And these were constructed, uh, as I said, in the 1990s with some some parameters that worked for back then. Um, they it were two-sided for display, which uh, any of us who have worked with uh, two-sided cases know that that creates a, another level of complexity. And what they also were was um, not just simple, they were actually weighed about uh, 120 pounds. So uh, shout out here to Charles and um, Dan, who we needed two people to actually lift these cases. So unlike National Treasures, you cannot pick this case up um, and put it under your arm. I remember some of my wonderful colleagues from conservation saying, please make people know you cannot pick this up and put it under your arm and run out of the building with it, which is a good thing too. So we had heavy gauge stainless steel, um, dimensions there, low off gassing uh, gaskets, plexiglass, because that's what we were using at the time, and then the, the document was suspended um, with for the two sides between stable text. And so you can see there, you saw a little bit of this pattern um, when you got close up. But as you heard also with uh, National Archives, uh, sometimes uh, things happened over time. We really needed to look at adjusting some of the... Uh, components and uh, the performance of these cases. So in 2008 and 9, there were modifications made to the cases. And as part of this, uh, again, working, you, you, you'll hear the name Dr. Charles Tilford a number of times, and he was he was just integral for, for both of our institutions. And so with this, we actually set up a process of, of actually monitoring what was in the case at the time, how we could monitor this over time, and make sure that we were controlling the environment. So uh, this was set up um, 
took quite a lot of testing. You'll probably hear the word testing mentioned quite a few times because you have to test and then retest and then retest. And the beauty of it was that this ended up uh, going into an external case. And uh, this goes back a few years, but it actually went into creating the Declaration of Independence exhibit. And I think, uh, excuse my poor photography here, but I think you can see when you start to look at the case, you wouldn't be aware that this is actually an anoxic encasement, just looking at that from the side. So this was uh, really, when I mean, this went on exhibit, it, uh, they had queues going right round the block for it and they opened late at night, which is rather wonderful. The next encasement was quite a bit larger, and this was the Voltsmuller 1507 world map. And the background behind this, um, as you know, many of you know already, was that this was the, the, the only known surviving copy of this, and really the first map printed um, too clearly depict a separate Western Hemisphere. Uh, coming from the South Pacific, I was quite excited that it had the Pacific as a separate ocean, so we all have our different perspectives of this. And one of the reasons behind uh, this, uh, the reasons for creating a anoxic encasement, was that th this was um, purchased from the the Federal Republic of Germany and the German states uh, of Baden-Württemberg, and this export license was granted and it was required to be um, on exhibit. Um, I know some of my colleagues at the Smithsonian also have this challenge with the Star Spangled Banner and other materials, and this was part of the rationale behind creating the uh, anoxic encasement. So that was the original volume came out of, um, the original map was uh, bound into this volume. And so... The total encasement, uh, about 9 by 5 feet, so we're, we're talking a significant, uh, rather large encasement, about 2,200 pounds. This did not easily move. And we had a number of uh, systems that have been set up for thinking about the ceiling. And some of the, much of this knowledge um, was built upon and learnt from what we've learnt from the National Archives. So it's very much a collaborative effort in thinking uh, through this. So the argon was humidified, um, then we, we monitored for changes, and uh, here you can start to see some of the behind the scenes, uh, some of our wonderful colleagues from conservation here, cleaning the, uh, the single tool block of aluminum, and then dropping the, not dropping, placing the map gently on its backing board into, uh, then the, the bars were, uh, screwed down. Uh, the, the, this is a whole different story which has been uh, presented uh, separately. And then after that goes in, the entire encasement was wheeled under the hurricane-proof glass. All of this was done in a very manual way. Uh, we've Many of us have learnt over the years that uh, doing things high-tech, electronic and or uh, mechanical doesn't necessarily work and so being able to control very carefully what was happening and then you can see here that we had to place it very precisely under that and if you look here in the center this had to be lowered down over the uh, so the the top glass and frame was lowered down over the encasement then we had a scissor jack in the center and we had uh, to lift this up we actually counted and we did the same thing when we brought it down. We had two people at each side carefully rotating and lifting up the scissor jacks and we counted so that we did not get any talking in the frame. What we have here is that single tool block of aluminum. The back of this is about um, three-eighths of an inch and it, because of that it could flex but we also had challenges with how the hurricane-proof glass on the front would actually work. So this was part of the, the challenges and the monitoring over time. This was uh, not quite as ornate as the, some of the later uh, setups uh, for the monitoring. And Andrew will talk more to this. And then here we are with this wonderful map on exhibit and everyone's around the back looking at the the monitoring, it's one of Andrew's and, and my favourite one. So we have the, the encasement here and then it goes into um, an exhibit where once again you, you don't quite see where it's at. So 
that was putting it on exhibit, but that's only the first part of it. Now we have to really look at what's happening. There was a requirement for a 20 to 30 year seal, so we really had to understand you know, what was what was behind this and did we have the right materials. Again, um, the the whole construction design, um, Alma Usman was uh, integral as a number of folks from conservation. With that collaboration between the designers and the conservators, scientists and curators. So it was a very collaborative process, a lot of back and forth, a lot of trips out to um, NIST. Uh, some interesting things that happened along the way. And uh, this is just a, a, a zoom in, but you can just see the intensity and the precision and the amount of work that goes into the, these types of drawings and the, the thought process behind it. It's just a phenomenal. So with the construction, we needed to meet those design requirements. We And again, as I said, we needed to leak test, leak test, and leak test. And there were, again, surprises along the way. So that single-tooled aluminum, the laminated hurricane-proof glass, the uh, high-purity argon, argon um, gas. There were 92 bolts for security. We learned early on that we had to actually be careful about how we talked them and in what order we actually bolted them. So by bolting from certain, you know, if you didn't start at the corners and work in, you could actually talk the case. So there were some really significant things that happened. And then part of the design modification was uh, with the double groove, we ended up putting a, a feed tube above and below just to make sure that the, the flush through the case uh, was actually spread out and more even and captured that. So the monitoring, uh, Andrew will talk, uh, um, um, t this is a big teaser for all of the work that he's going to share with you. And some of the challenges with the case, and we did make a change in design when we got to the Buell, was that the, you can see here, quite a narrow door into the back of that. Um, and then we go in and the um, we have one entry point in and out uh, at the case to minimise any leakage issues. What we also worked on with NIST, um, some of you may recall Dick Rohrer, um, who was at NIST at the time, and he created a flexible encasement model. What we really wanted to understand was what would happen when there were huge pressure changes and if the differential pressure with storms coming in, uh, what, what did that mean? Uh, friends and colleagues of mine where I was frantic during Sandy because I could not get in. I was like, "What? what is going on with this case um, when well, we're having hurricanes? But we had the safe zone that we knew that we could work within, and then we monitored very conservatively within this atmospheric pressure range so that we knew exactly when it started to shift outside of this zone, and we had time to actually release the pressure uh, on the for the encasement to equalise the pressure. So there were a lot of moving parts and adaptations and changes that were made to assure the, the safety of the map over, over time. So the monitoring issues, and Andrew will talk more about these, but what are the limits of the sensors, the limits of detection? How do we maintain and upgrade over time? Sometimes the manufacturing support disappears or you realise that the file format is not as accessible as you thought. How do you interpret the data if you're trying to put together data from two different sensors? And uh, you know the notifications for any it, it alerts and mod changes. I will note, um, it's easy to say this now, but I could guarantee that any time the case was going to go out of spec, it happened about 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, and it fixed itself about 3 on a Sunday without fail. It never did it during week time. Um, it just somehow knew. And then the sensor calibration, um, this is a, I'm, I think I may have actually gotten the position because of my lack of height, uh, because you, there wasn't a lot of space in the back of this case. And this is one of our colleagues, uh, Matt Coleman, who was six foot eight, and he had very long arms, so the combination of the two of us uh, worked, worked very well. So you can see that distance here. So these are some of the challenges and things we had to really think about um, for those creating an encasement that would stand the test of time. The next encasement that uh, we worked on was the Abel Buell uh, New and Correct Map of the United States of North America. And this was um, an interesting map. It was the first map 
uh, of the newly independent United States, compiled, printed, and published in America by an American. And the the intriguing component, um, we're talking a lot about technical, so I thought we'd put some of these fun facts in. He was apprenticed as an engraver. Uh, he actually used those skills to produce counterfeit currency. He was apparently quite charming. Um, so when he was tried and convicted, uh, the they actually had to brand a, a C on um, on his forehead, but the the judge allowed it to be where he could actually put his here across his forehead. So, and then because of the New York's uh, border warfare with Connecticut, he actually omitted New York State's name on the map. So it's, it's I always find it fascinating that history is very much defined by who is creating the history at the time. So we really wanted to uh, look at what was the current condition of the map, what were the best conditions for display and identifying the materials in it. Uh, and again, um, Cindy Connolly Ryan was um, heavily involved both for this and for the, the Voldsmuller map. And with some of the imaging, uh, we looked at, went on exhibit for six weeks, just uh, in, just on the wall, um, normal conditions. We saw some very minute changes after just six weeks of being on exhibit. And so that allowed us to really think about what the what the conditions should be and because of the Prussian blue then we uh, kept the encasement at about 5% uh, oxygen to preserve uh, to lower it from the 21% oxygen but preserve the, uh, the the fragile and light sensitive colorants as well and uh, just love the the action shot so again uh, there's Matt Coleman uh, cleaning and then we have some of our colleagues from conservation carefully lifting the map into the encasement the map's now waiting for its uh, 30 pound uh, glass and frame. I will note that, uh, as you'll see more, this case was required to be movable, and that's still quite a, a heavy encasement, but we did move it from the Madison over to the Jefferson building. And then installing the hurricane proof glass, uh, and I just would like to take a, a short pause here and acknowledge one of our former colleagues, Hans Wang, who is no longer with us. The frame was lowered onto the glass to secure to the base, and then myself looking rather intense as I put some bolts in there as we work with that. The frame and the glass, so 1,200 pound encasement, and we then have to move this over to another building. So uh, Dwayne, I promised I'd give him a shout out. I couldn't be with us. Then we moved it through the corridor, less than an inch total clearance in the elevator. I remember Mark Sweeney, who was our director at the time, telling me I looked a wee bit stressed. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I think so. And uh, this is where I realised I wasn't as tall as I thought. And But we, we got it through and in and over. And what we also did, we uh, had a, a lot more involvement in the design of the back of the case, uh, which is many of us who have worked with this realise that that's the critical when you're trying to actually get into monitor. Even just having a light switch that you can turn on and off, that was one of our critical requirements. And then this went on exhibit and we controlled the light uh, through sensors to have a lower and higher level for this. So with that, um, we'd like to just take a, a, a 10 minute pause, uh, give you a chance to stretch and then um, Andrew will be with us in 10 minutes. So give you a few minutes stretch. Thank you. So welcome back everybody. It gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Dr. Andrew Davis, who is a chemist and polymer scientist at the Library of Congress's Preservation Research and Testing Division. He's currently involved in work to analyse the library's various paper and polymer collections with the goal of correlating fundamental polymer properties to preservation concerns in objects of cultural heritage, spanning paper, the users, and audiovisual materials. Andrew's also involved in work to better understand the role of light, oxygen, and substrate in the fugitive nature of pigments in order to better enable public display of light sensitive objects. He enjoys working with interns and visiting researchers from high school students to postdocs. Andrew received a PhD in polymer science and engineering at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And prior to the Library of Congress, he worked at the Central Research Library's laboratories of 3M, focused on photochemical processes affecting polymers and the 
materials and mm-hmm. colored materials. So we stole them from industry and it's our absolute game with refugees. I'm going to tell you about the analysis that we did um, during deinstallation. And so Fenella kind of ended with setting up those cases and getting them all built and placed. And I'm going to tell you about what happened recently when we took them off, about um, a year or two ago. And so I came in in the middle of the lifetimes of these encasements. Um, you saw lots of photos of Matt Coolman. Matt was there when these were set up and built. Um, and when I joined, I came in about halfway through their lifetime and Matt showed me the ropes, Matt left. And so I would kind of joined in on this midstream. Everything was already running. We had the two maps, the ones that Fenella showed you, the, the anoxic encasement for the Waltz-Muller world map and the hypoxic encasement for the Buell map. And a couple years ago, it was decided that those encasements were going to be deinstalled during some um, gallery renovations. And I got really excited uh, because there hadn't been much that had been analyzed at that scale for these kind of encasements, right? There's a nice selection of lab studies, um, some measurements here and there of, of encasements that were used in the real world. Um, but from large sealed encasements with maps and objects like this that were in use for over 10 years, um, there, there really weren't many studies, many comprehensive studies. And by not many, I mean that I don't know any. Um, that doesn't mean that they don't exist, so I may be missing them, um, but I, I'm unaware of any that, that were terribly comprehensive. And so this is, why, this is what got us excited um, to take a look at. And so we opened them up after 10 years, 15 years roughly for the Walter Mueller world map, and then 10 years for the Buell map. And I'll jump right to the punchline, right? I'll tell you what happened to the things that were inside of these cases, and the answer is nothing. Um, very little. We, we couldn't measure very much of any change in anything that went on in these cases. Um, the encasements worked remarkably well. They held their desired atmospheres. They didn't cause any accelerated breakdown that we could measure. Uh, we didn't see any unexpected or surprising changes within them or on the objects that were in them. And like I said, this was kind of cool. This was the first known case of an analysis of this magnitude. These were really big cases. Just a quick reminder, uh, if you're joining us for the first time or if you know the break stretched on a little while, we had the two map cases, the Walter Mueller 1507 world map that was anoxic with about 500 parts per million or less of oxygen. That equates to about 0.05 percent. And then there was the Buell map, which Fenella talked about sealed up in hypoxic conditions at 5 percent oxygen levels. These were hermetically sealed. There was no airflow. We didn't pump in inert gas continuously. We didn't have any continuous flow throughout them. There was no independent <coughs> control on them. They kind of fluctuated around with whatever was going on in the gallery at the time. But we did have real-time monitoring to see what was going on at any moment in time. So these were the analysis um, that we did. And this is roughly going to be the outline for what I'm going to talk about for the next little bit. Uh, we measured the atmospheres of those cases, both what was around the cases, what was in the cases, both oxygen as well as any other kind of environmental volatiles. We did some colorimetry measurements, micro spots as well as larger scale color. We also did some degradation studies. There's this unique chance to study some other materials involved and how they were breaking down over time. I do want to emphasize at this point that these were really observational in nature, right? This is not a scientific technical study where you have controls and variables where you're trying to find something new. We really wanted to, but in the end, this is we could only measure what was coming out and we could only measure this one object, right? And so you may come away with some of this with more questions. We certainly came away with more questions. Um, it, it's not the kind of study where you come away with some big sweeping answer for how things are going. And so like I jumped to the conclusions at the top for each of those sections, I'm going to start with just telling you what happened before I dig into the data. So thinking about the oxygen in these cases, uh, we could confirm that those cases held their low oxygen atmospheres uh, with no dramatic leaks for their entire duration, for those 15 years and 10 years for the two map cases. So starting with the Waltzemuller world map, uh, we measured the leak rates. This was live data across 15 years, roughly. And so for the entire exhibit, the case was below 800 parts per million. Most of the time, actually, it was below 500 parts per million. Uh, there are some data spikes in this data. Those, we can confirm, are entirely due to various sensor-related events. They were due to calibrations that were isolated 
from the case itself. They were due to communication problems or power failures in the building where the instrument would reset itself and give really weird readings. So it looked like there might be some, some oddities in this data. It's really, we can confirm, isolated to the sensors and not to the cases. We would produce annual reports each year on what's going on with the cases in the past year. And if you're interested in any of those particular events or details, we can, we can dig into any of those. If you're not used to thinking of parts per million oxygen, just wanted to give you a benchmark of what is open air like in relation, right? There's 21% oxygen in air. So all I did here was rescale the y-axis, just so you can see what's going on. Open air is there at 21,000 parts per million oxygen. The Walton Mueller map data is all the way flat at the bottom there, no oxygen in this case. Some really cool work we got to do looking at leak rates. Um, Charles Tilford did a lot of work in the first couple months of installation to see could we predict how much uh, air would leak into these cases, over what time, how good would they hold their seal for below half a percent of uh, oxygen. And so with 15 years of data, we could check that extrapolation. And we saw that that was pretty good, actually. Um, it wasn't perfect. We didn't expect it to be perfect. But it still was at least 100 years um, of not having to do anything that, that we expected this data based on our 15 years of measurement to hold that anoxia. So that was the Waltz Mueller map. Looking at the Buell map, so this is not parts per million levels, right? This was at 5 or 6 percent oxygen. This was sealed up at about 6 percent oxygen. Um, the leak rates were probably comparable to Walter Mueller, um, but here we're dealing with a much larger oxygen reading. So if you're having part per million level leak rates, you're not going to be able to see it in this data. It is essentially flatlined. It's holding its desired atmosphere. Much like the other situation, you'll see oddities in this data. This is a case of a failing sensor. Uh, there was some discussion from Jen about that particular oxygen sensor and needing airflow and worried about degradation. Well, this is what happens, right? You can see a failing sensor. It reads some oddities uh, that we could confirm with our other sensors and other measurements were not true representations of the environment in that case, right? This was really a failing sensor. And we know that for sure because when we open this up, the grand opening, we very carefully had a completely independent oxygen sensor hooked up to the outlet of this case, and we measured that oxygen level right as we unsealed it. And sure enough, that measurement at deinstallation was right on par with what we thought was sealed up the entire time. So we knew that, that that really truly was a failing sensor. Again, relative to oxygen levels, you can see this is not zero oxygen. It is intentionally uh, at an elevated level, but it is still, say, less oxygen than you would have on Mount Everest, for example. Um, and that live monitoring was really invaluable in a lot of different ways. Uh, it let us have that easy confirmation of different sensors at different moments in time to see what was going on with the case, but also what was going on relative to all the other sensors. And so we could use those as kind of redundancy checks of if one sensor is reading weird but all the others are fine, that's probably a sensor problem and not a catastrophic leak situation. Um, we could have rapid responses to changes in building conditions or weather events, like Fenella mentioned. Uh, it also gave us some remote access during COVID, right? This, these cases were sealed up during peak COVID um, when access to this building was actually kind of a problem. Um, we couldn't get people here all the time. We couldn't have people on site checking things, n not all in one place. And so we could look at this data live online remotely and confirm that even if we weren't here, these cases were doing what they thought they were doing. And we really could only do this through some of that cross-divisional work um, of us and of OCIO, our IT department, uh, making sure that all this communication stayed up to date. We measure temperature and humidity values as well. I'm not going to get too much into depth on these, um, but these, again, a reminder, there was no temperature control specific to the cases. We were kind of at the whims of the gallery around it, um, but it did stay within the temperature fluctuations and ranges um, that we had hoped that they would stay. Um, in range of. And so that was the oxygen levels. And so what else about the environment? Well, we wanted to know what gases were inside this encasement, right? There's this idea that, you know, materials as they degrade and naturally age over time, they emit small molecules or volatile organic compounds, VOCs. And so if you've sealed this up in hermetic case, maybe there's a buildup of those off-gassing products, there's a concern because those can accelerate degradation even further. And if you've kind of sealed it all up, maybe there's a problem with those that, that you might need to worry about. And so uh, Dr. Monroe and Kelly Stoneburner in our group are experts at this kind of analysis. They did some really neat new analyses on this. And punchline, before I show you some of that data, there were no unusual VOCs. 
and there was no dramatic buildup, right? We didn't see any unusual compounds that we didn't expect to see, and we didn't see any real buildup of them. We were able to do that because of that manifold on the back. Um, and we, have, we actually have it deconstructed over there on the table for those in the room who want to go and see it. And what that manifold does, you can see the two knobs on the sides. Those let you isolate it from the full volume of the case, right? And so if we were doing sensor work, if we were doing calibrations, if we were checking on things, we could isolate those sensors and that manifold volume from the whole case. I mention this only because I want to say that the internal case volume was largely undisturbed for 15 years, right? I showed you calibration events, but when we go and measure what was building up in that case, we didn't flush it all out during one of these calibration events, right? that full case kept whatever was in it for the whole time that it was sealed up. And this is how Eric and Kelly did it. Um, it's, it was a pretty new method, so it's hard for us to compare this quantitatively and directly to other analyses like this. Um, but they came up with a, a really nice new way of doing this, taking these air sampling bags fitted with a gas sampling fixture so it could hold a gas-tight seal, hooked it up to the manifold. We could push air into these bags, close them up, have a bag full of smelly encasement air, and then push that through an absorption tube where it would absorb any of the molecules that had been floating around in the encasement and then analyze them by thermal desorption, gas chromatography, mass spec. And so for any of you who are used to looking at kind of mass spec data, uh, this will look familiar. If you're not, don't worry too much about it. Each of those peaks is showing you a different compound that was analyzed from the gaseous environment in there. Uh, there were a considerable amount of compounds floating around. The vast majority of them were related to the gas sampling equipment and the encasement itself. Parts of the encasement, the seal, for example, had fluorinated molecules floating around, that, that elastomeric seal. And those we knew were non-reactive, right? Those types of things, they were there, but they're not reactive. They're not things we're concerned about chemically. Those are marked with asterisks in the plot here. The ones that are not marked with asterisks are the ones that are related to paper degradation, natural breakdown of these products, acetic acid and furfural and hexanols, things like that. And that's what we saw. And we didn't see anything unusual um, that we weren't expecting to see. We could also compare these, and, and Eric and Kelly were able to compare these, to measurements that they did in gas sampling of some of our other spaces that had paper materials of comparable age, 1500s to the 16 and 1700s. And so I'm showing you, for example, the concentration of furfural that we measured within the two cases compared to, say, a storage area. This is where we have some of our reference papers, again, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, of a similar age. The concentration within that sealed environment was comparable to the concentration in a well-ventilated storage cabinet. There was no buildup of volatiles in here that we might have been concerned about. And in fact, some of these other enclosed spaces, like the Jefferson cases, um, have Jefferson's books likely had more buildup of some of these compounds than, than the anoxic encasements did. There was a kind of unusual finding of some of the ratios of these compounds were in ratios that we didn't see in some of our other spaces. I'm not going to get too much in depth unless people want to, but it's a, showing here the acetic acid and furfural ratios. Two of those different compounds, how much of them relative to each other. The two cases actually had much less furfural than they did of acetic acid, which is not a ratio that we saw in any of our other natural degradation byproducts in other storage spaces. We think that that is possibly due to that anoxic atmosphere. It's inhibiting some of those degradation pathways. And so you're getting different breakdown products and different ratios of those breakdown products. It's not in a concerning way. It's not something we concern, you know, one is more reactive than the other, but they're just different. And that's something that we're really kind of interested in looking at further. So those are the cases, right? Those are the volatiles, those are the atmospheres, that's the oxygen, but we had low oxygen for a reason, right? That's great, fantastic, the cases were really good, but what happened to the color, right? What happened to the maps? We, we wanna know that the whole purpose here was to prevent photooxidation, light and oxygen. We take out the oxygen, like we showed you, and we know it's out of there. What happened to the colorimetry? What happened to the materials in this map? And so Finella showed this, this point um, in her talk that in that exhibit, that inaugural exhibit of the Buell map, for just six weeks in air and light, we could maybe just start to see some color changes by spectroscopy. Nothing by eye, but things you, would, you could detect by spectrometer, right? This is the suggestive evidence of why we wanted those, that oxygen levels. And so what did we see? We wanted to know because there was a lot of light on the map, right? This was, this was a substantial amount of light. It was low intensity light, but aggregated over their entire exhibition, right? Permanent exhibit, these were, these were exhibited and illuminated 
for the whole time they were on display, it adds up to a lot of light. That ends up being about 5 million lux hours of light exposure on the Waltzenmuller map. Buell map was a little more complicated. Fenella mentioned the different uh, light levels, uh, depending on the motion sensor, but it's still in the millions of lux hours range of total light exposure, which is substantial. And so the punchline here, before I get into more of the data, is we were really challenged to detect any color change beyond natural variations that were already present in the maps themselves. Right? So behind that text, you can see an image, this was taken on removal, uh, of one of the pages from the Waltzenmuller map. And the Waltzenmuller world map had these grid lines. Those were one of these aspects of the map that people were concerned about before it went on exhibit, right? Before it went on, before it came to the library, right when it got here, it was noticed that these grid lines were kind of faded. They were hard to see, they were already faded. And the worry was, well, if we're gonna expose to millions of lux hours of light, they might disappear entirely, right? We don't know what their reactivity still is. We don't want them to disappear, obviously. You wanna be able to see them. And so prior to encasement, there was a lot of work done uh, by Cindy on microfade testing and colorimetry analysis and light sensitivity analysis of what was going on with some of these colorants on both maps. Here's that grid line, just to see, you know, is this something we need to be worried about? And so for people who don't know microfade testing, I'm not gonna get too in the weeds on it, just to give you a very bare bone sense so you can follow along the next couple slides, because they will be in the weeds. Uh, they will be a little technical. So microfade testing takes a tiny micro spot, less than a millimeter in diameter, exposes it exposes your test site to a broad spectrum light, generally of high intensity, and you measure what's reflected back. And that gives you the color spectrum, it gives you color space coordinates. You might be familiar with, say, RGB and digital displays. Here we're working in a different color space, LAB color space, but it's the same idea. And you can use this technique to either expose a test material to extended light exposure to see how it might fade over time. Um, you could also compare two different spots to each other, right, right next to each other and see what is the color metric difference. Now that you can kind of quantify this color, you have a number to compare one to another, you can say quantitatively what's the difference. Is this something you can see? And there's this convention called the delta E calculation that just lets you do that quantitatively. I've got two, a, a bunch of color swaths here. You can see what those various delta E values might look like. We're working through about five levels of screen games of telephone here, so you might not be able to see those those differences. But you can believe me that, that those color swaths are different in differing degrees. And so there was a lot of testing done before. There was microfade testing, but there was also some just general contextual knowledge of what these maps were made of to identify what parts of the maps were going to be the most concerning under light exposure for an extended duration of time. In the Waltzmuller map, there were various red inks on you know, grid lines and dots. There was iron gall ink in one region. You had residues and stains from prior treatments that, that we could see, and we were worried some of those might discolor. The Buell map had tons of colorants all over it, and so you wanted to know which of those could potentially be a problem. Prussian blue was found on, on the map. That's one that really drove that idea of hypoxia. I'll get a little more into, into that in a minute. But we knew what these materials were, so the compelling question, right, is, Great, Cindy did all of this amazing work analyzing these right before it went on. We know exactly the spots that she measured. We open them up, we take the maps out, let's measure the spots again. Let's get those numbers. Let's see what they look like right afterwards. That's what you gotta do, right? And that's what I really, really wanted to do. And that's what I tried to do, and it was hard. Um, this is a really challenging thing to do, right? That turns out to not be as simple as it sounds. And I'll tell you why, right? So the same test spot, you can't test again. It's already been exposed to a broad spectrum high intensity light, as small as it is, right before it went on exhibit. It's not gonna give you any useful information if you measure that exact same spot again. So you can try to measure a nearby spot of the same material, right next to that little spot, you could measure that red grid line again, or another grid line intersection, but it's going to be a little bit different. It's not going to match exactly the first spot you measured. The other challenge is that this testing that was done pre-exhibit was done over a decade ago, right? There's standard wear and tear of the instrument. We've replaced the bulb. We've replaced some of the fiber optic cable. The test spaces are different. We used to do microfade testing in this room. We do it over in this room now. And that environment might affect some of the measurements. The test standards are noted to have some consistency problems. Even if we try to simplify this and we say, well, how does it compare to a blue wool, for example? There's been some publications lately documenting some of those consistency concerns of blue wools over time. So can you even make that comparison? It turns out to be really tricky to try to compare some of these colors in the same way. So one of the first things I did was to say, well, how similar is a similar color? 
What's the limits of detection that we can measure on color change? So here's the, the, uh, a page, a section of the Buell map. Um, zoom in near the Bay of Fundy here, and you've got this green border. And what I did was I took the microfade tester and I nudged it, just a tiny fraction of a spot size. And I say, what's the difference? If I just move this spot just a little bit, what's the color difference naturally inherent in this colorant? And for those of you who might know what the number means, it's a delta E of about two, right? This tiny, tiny micro scale difference. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. It just sets a baseline, right, for what we can expect to even be able to identify as a meaningful color change. So a side by side, identical spot away has a delta E of two. Quantitation of that change is two. And so simplified, that means if we try to do a before and after comparison of similar materials, any delta E, any change in color that's two or less, we can't say anything. We say that's just natural variation. I can't tell you if that's changed color or not in any meaningful way. That is the absolute best case scenario. This was me with the same instrument on the same day in the same lab space, and me, the same user. It's not even someone else's hand using it, right? If we're talking about those differences now across a decade, that value is probably even higher, right? I bet it's even harder to tell that number, but we can't put a, a number on that. So I'll show you the numbers because I tried. I really wanted to know. This is, this is the compelling question. Um, and it turns out that, that those spots, as close to the same spot as we could measure, were generally very close to those limits of detection at natural variation. We couldn't identify any obvious, remarkable, dramatic color change in any of them. They were all right on that level of variation. Some of them maybe looked a little bit higher, this still was 10 years of exhibit, right? But if you start looking at some of the other delta E's in wider distances across the map, you also approach these values of very large delta E's. So really all we could say, for better or for worse, is that the color differences following these exhibitions in anoxia and hypoxia can't be distinguished from natural variation. That's pretty remarkable. That was a lot of light on these maps, and we can't see any big changes. Right? You can also check the spectra themselves. Right? If you don't want to do that delta E business and you don't like that calculation because of its challenge, you can at least look at the spectral curves and look at the way you expect them to change over time based on previous testing. For example, here is a reflectance spectra from that red grid line. And from 2007, we could see that maybe that little dip of a feature is a characteristic feature that changed with light exposure during testing for microfade testing. And while the 2022 removal analysis showed kind of an offset of that spectra, that's really just a saturation effect. We're measuring in a different location. The reds may be a little bit brighter, a little bit darker, because it's a different area. But that feature is still there. Right? That feature that we expect to change didn't change dramatically. So a lot of that was from the, the Waltz-Muller world map. The Buell map, Fenella mentioned, I gave kind of a bit of foreshadowing, was a, a challenging case because it had some reactive colorants on it. There are some colorants, for people who don't work in anoxia, who haven't thought about this, who haven't read the literature maybe, um, that don't respond well to anoxia. Most of them do. Most of them, you take away the air, you prevent photo oxidation, and they'll preserve their color under light, much better than they will under air. Prussian blue is kind of your poster child for a situation when that's not true, right? Prussian blue actually can recover its faded color if you put it in the dark, but it needs air to do so. And if you take away the air and you expose it to light, it won't recover that color. And in fact, it can discolor even worse. And so that was the concern, right, about the Buell map. That was the concern that made that decision to say, let's intentionally introduce 5 to 6% oxygen into this encasement to help preserve the Prussian blue colorant, because we really don't want that blue in the flag discoloring. It'd be really obvious, right? Um, and so that was one of the first things we checked. We opened up the Buell case, we said, measure the blue. What happened to the Prussian blue? And it was identical, right? We really struggled to see any differences using the microfade testing method in, in that Prussian blue. The spectra looked the same. The delta E quantification of color was within variation error. We really, we couldn't see anything that was different. Exact amounts of anoxia are still really of interest to us, right? We're really interested in saying, well, if it was 5%, do you need 5%, do you need 2%? Where are some of these trade-offs in materials that benefit from anoxia and don't benefit from anoxia? And that's some ongoing research that we're really interested in doing, working with NIST still to build some, some test fixtures for really exploring that question. I will say, right, that if you check with another instrument, you might measure a slightly different thing. 
So this is from the multispectral imaging. This is Megan and Finella did some analysis, kind of a, a mirror version of that analysis they did from the inaugural six weeks of exposure. They said, well, can we check spectral change of the same regions using multispectral imaging after we open it up compared to the data from before? And here, maybe there was a little bit of change, right? There was maybe a little color change detectable in different regions. Um, this is also complicated to interpret. There's been a complete replacement of the multispectral equipment since that time, so we're using a completely different set of instrumentation here. It uses pixel averaging, so you're averaging over different pixels and regions. Um, this shift that was maybe seen in the multispectral imaging was not seen in our other colorimetric measurements, right? And in fact, those trends where we're seeing maybe some slight, what is it, darkening here, were opposite of what we predicted from microfate testing, which saw maybe lightening during light exposure. So the fact that none of this correlates with any of it, any of the other testing, any of the other trends that we saw, really makes us think that these are instrumental vari variations, right? If there was any big dramatic change, we would have seen the same kind of big dramatic change in all of our instruments to some degree or another, and we failed to see that, right? These looked really good when they came out, right? So, so to kind of wrap this part up, the, um, these sites showed, no, showed minimal, no to minimal differences following exhibition, the colors, the, the markings on the maps. Any differences varied from each other, right? The microfade testing didn't quite match the spectral imaging, didn't quite match predictions from accelerated microfade testing, and they were generally less than the natural variations present. So the, the most we could definitively say about this, right, is that the measurements were below the detection limits. Definitively, you, you, the data we have, you know, that's what it shows. Um, the likely interpretation of that, right, is that the exhibit didn't cause any, any differences to occur. Maybe that was beneficial, maybe it just was low light levels, but there was nothing that happened. These cases prevented some of that, that change from happening, likely. Now, why did some of those microfade predictions not quite match what we saw in the maps? That gets to be an active area of research as well. Um, this whole idea of reciprocity, if you're in the microfade testing world, um, is an idea that's of interest. Um, that testing exposed these materials to much more intense amounts of light for a shorter period of time, the exhibits were much less intense, but for longer periods of time. Maybe that had an effect on why these differences existed. There were also spectral differences, right? The microfade light had a different kind of spectral emission of light than the LED lights that were used on the exhibit. Maybe that had an effect as well, and that's something also that we're looking at. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause for about 10 seconds here, because that was a lot. That was, that was, that was kind of technically intense. Um, just kind of catch our breath for a moment and think also, right, that all of that was really sciencey, but it's impossible to ignore the human element here, right? There was no uh-oh factor when we opened these cases. We opened it up, we took the glass off, we removed, you know, the frames, the maps came out, the blues were still blue, the grid lines were still there, no one looked and said, uh-oh, the blue turned to gray, right? It, it looked good, and that's an important consideration, I think. There were a couple other ways to check color that I got really excited about, because um, they started approaching more of a scientific study sort of thing. We had some variables, some controls, some areas that we could directly compare to another um, that's a little more in that kind of fundamental science approach. And so the rest of my talk is going to talk about those. It's not as long as the other parts, so don't worry too much. Um, if, if you were eagle-eyed and looking at the Walter Mueller map, you'll have noticed that there actually were multiple pages in the Walter Mueller map, right? There's that little square underneath. That was just the, uh, the mounting material for, for mounting those pages in the map. And so if you think about this, and we were thinking about this, we said, well, wait a second. These pages were overlapped to create a visually cohesive map, to line everything up, to look like just one map. There were areas then that were in the encasement, exposed to the various volatiles, exposed to the temperature changes, exposed to the light, but areas that were not exposed to the light, right? They were shadowed underneath part of these margins. You can see, right, a page here where you have a region that might be right next to another region where you had light and you didn't have light. And you can say, well, okay, what happened in these regions where there was light and where there wasn't light? And so the yellow squares show where there was light exposure, the black circles show where there was shadowed regions of the same page on multiple pages. This happened on multiple pages. And we checked all of them, 
right? And so this is that color space measurement, LAB color space. Um, I'm showing you L star here. Um, five million lux hours of exposure, you can't tell the regions that had light on them and that didn't have light on them. And any of the color space parameters look the same. A star, no difference. B star, no difference. We can check this by multispectral imaging too. We can look and really try to emphasize the variation in reflected color. Uh, so here was some data from Megan looking on, on where kind of differentiations of color occurred in that paper material. You can see right on the edges, sort of that highlight. That's kind of an analytical false color analysis that by principal component analysis that shows where color change might be present. That is not as wide as those margins were. That is almost certainly from handling, from machining of the paper. And if you really zoom in and really focus that analysis on where that margin occurs, so on the bottom here is, is you can see a yellow square highlighting where a margin of overlap occurred, really using the power of statistical analysis through principal component analysis. It extracts variation and really emphasizes any variation that exists, and you can't see where that margin occurred. You can't see these regions that received light and that didn't receive light. There was no real difference that occurred from light exposure. If you were also eagle-eyed, you might notice that there was something else in this map case, particularly in the Waltzmuller one, but um, we all had it too, where it was not the map, it was the backing paper, right? And so this backing paper is a paper that was placed behind the map, exposed to the exact same environment. It had those volatiles, it had the temperature change, it had the oxygen levels. It had regions that were exposed to light, it had regions that were shadowed from light where the map covered it up. But this was not precious, right? We could do all sorts of new analysis on this backing paper that we couldn't do on the map because we could take samples from it. And so we wanted to look at this for colorimetry. Not only did we have that backing paper that was encased, we also had backing paper that was in storage, right? This was backing paper that conservation had in their storage area. We in, in the research and testing labs also had the same backing paper, offcuts from it from when this map was installed, same paper that was just in ambient conditions, stored in the dark, in our labs, normal oxygen, and we could compare those. So this really gets into kind of a fundamental science study now. We have controls, we have darks, we have lights, we have materials with oxygen, without oxygen, and, and what happened? Nothing. We couldn't tell the difference, right? We did colorimetry tricks on the backing paper. Um, that kind of left side, complete overlap in the exhibit of shadowed or unshadowed or exposed backing paper, we couldn't tell them apart. We couldn't tell them apart from the two different offcuts that were placed in two different regions of storage. They looked identical. I'm just showing L star here, but you can trust me. A star and B star look the same. Couldn't tell the difference. Um, one of my favorite methods is degree of polymerization. Basically, this is a, a kind of a bread and butter method of polymer science, where you're looking at the polymer uh, condition of your sample. In this case, we're looking at cellulose. Cellulose is the main component of paper. And we wanted to see, right, what the kind of molecular weight is what it's called, the, the length of the, the cellulose chains <coughs> that are in paper. As paper breaks down, those chains start falling apart. They break in predictable ways. And it's very sensitive to degradation, right? You'll start cleaving cellulose chains before you'll notice anything is starting to degrade kind of macroscopically by feeling it, by looking at it, by any properties. And so we could get those really, really subtle changes in molecular weight. And we could take this backing paper now and do molecular weight and degree of polymerization analysis. Um, and what we saw, so there's kind of the storage area in dark that was in air in dark and storage, light exposed regions that were in encased and shadowed regions that were encased. By and large, there was some scatter, but those error bars were all all within error of each other. Whether it was in the air, whether it was encased with the volatiles, whether it received light, whether it was shadowed, we couldn't see any difference in even the fundamental nature of the cellulose breakdown itself. The cellulose was not breaking down. Now, there was maybe one sample from one area that we took that had a slight difference, right on the edge of kind of error bars. Um, more measurements might, might reveal if that was you know, a real effect or not, that may have been on backing paper that was in contact of some of those residues from previous treatments. So maybe there was something going on you know, with contact of a different region. It's really hard to line those up. Um, but by and large, right, this really highlights that this was you know, an effective preservation strategy for the cellulose in there. Nothing broke down, right? Even at the molecular scale, as best we could measure, it didn't happen, right? 
So that's where I'm going to end. Um, that, was, that was a lot of stuff. That's where I'm going to end the technical technical part of it. Um, so the map cases right, have been deinstalled now. They're still at the library. Um, I, I, I'm still, you know, really delighted that this is the first time that cases of this scale with exhibits for this duration have been analyzed to this extent, right? It's not a real kind of scientific study, but it is a scientific analysis. And it lets us get some really important observational data on what these cases are doing and what, what is happening under anoxia. And I'm hoping that it is hopeful, that is insightful to other people who are interested in anoxia. So how did they do? Uh, it, without an exaggeration, we couldn't have asked for a better outcome. Right? They held their desired environment for 10 years for Buell, for 15 years for the Waltzmuller map. At the object level, there was no unusual discoloration, there was no degradation, there was no unusual volatiles. At the research level, we now have a lot of really interesting questions to follow up on in the lab, right? My first thought on this as we started analyzing things and it was what well, happened, nothing. And that, that felt kind of disappointing at first. And I was like, wait a second, that's kind of awesome. Nothing happened. That was, that was remarkable, I think. Um, it was tough, right? This was a tough analysis. Um, the whole project, the whole project of anoxia and encasements and maintaining them is difficult. There was a lot of challenges and a lot of kind of things that we learned. Um, some of the biggest challenge was the really boring work of multi-year preservation work. 10 and 15 years worth of data and knowledge and equipment and instruments. How do you keep all that running? How do you keep that transfer of knowledge going? Where's the report that Matt made, you know, 10 years ago that I need for recalibrating the oxygen sense? It's hard. Um, and losing some of that is, you know, making sure that you don't lose some of that is, is important. Um, changes in technology and their obsolescence is tough, you know? We had sensors break down and we say, well, great, let's go order a new oxygen sensor, only to find that they don't make that oxygen sensor anymore. So what are we going to do, right? The whole encasement was built around that fixture with attachments that were intended for that piece of equipment, and now we can't do it. What do we do? Right? It's a challenge keeping these things going for so long. Um, but I think that some of that sensor work was some of the most important stuff we did. It really let us have confidence in the effectiveness of, of you know, at least the environment that was going on until we took it off and could measure what happened with them. It let us respond in real time um, to, to what was going on with these cases. And so, if these work so great, do you want one? Um, is, is it good? Should, do we recommend this for people? And the answer is, maybe? Uh, think really hard, um, is, is our advice. Um, so there's a DC Area Encasement Science Working Group, uh, National Archives, right, who obviously are here today. We work with Smithsonian too. Um, we meet regularly uh, to talk about encasement challenges everything from sort of best practices to who has a spare leak sensor because ours is broken and we need one today to do this you know test or another but we've also been publishing white papers um, over the past couple years addressing this very idea to say what do you need to know if you really think that this is something you might be interested in and so two of these are available online a third is in the works at the moment. So I have the links if you want to go check them out. We have copies over on the table for those who are here uh, in attendance if you want to grab copies. And so watch this space or go ahead and read them because you kind of got the, the best minds on this topic pulling our thoughts together. Uh, this, I, I, you know, was up here talking. You were listening to my voice for a while, but this was a huge team effort. Um, and I can't even begin to acknowledge the people who were here before me because I I don't know them, right? It's a 15-year thing. This is a long project. Um, so I particularly want to thank the people who, you know, made the work that I was doing better, who really um, supported it, who really added more data that I, I couldn't have added. So particularly the post-exhibit analysis colleagues from research and testing, Fenella, Megan, uh, Eric, Cindy, Kelly, did a lot of work on this. The removal teams, it was, it was a big deal. Conservation, geography and maps, the exhibits team, AOC and facility staff who had a truck those things through the hallways, right? It was, it was a project. OCIO, uh, IT folks keeping the, the sensors up and running. Uh, NIST, obviously. Um, I don't think we've mentioned anyone else as much as we mentioned NIST today. NARA and Smithsonian, for sure, uh, just being really, really good colleagues. Past staff, um, Hans Wang, who passed recently, who's in a lot of those photos, as well as staff who have not passed, um, but, but just are not here presently at the library anymore, who I worked with quite closely for a while, including Matt and Lloyd, uh, Charles Tilford as well. Uh, Sean Miller, who, who produced a lot of the photos you've been seeing today, they're, they're remarkable when we were doing this work. We couldn't, you know, we were stressed out trying to figure out how to 
untorquable, and we weren't taking pictures. Um, so, so that's the end of the technical stuff. Um, I do, I do want to kind of end, actually end, end with a little, little non-technical things. So, um, this was a picture that that Fenella showed at the beginning. She said it was one of our favorite pictures, and, and it's true. This was during the the installation, right? And so, you have the first, you know, map published mentioning America, and everyone's around the back looking at whatever they're looking at, right? So I can, I can hear people watching now going, nerds, <laughs> nerds. So I want to talk about that a little bit, right? So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, I've got a soapbox here, so I'm going to take just a couple minutes for, for a soapbox here on my personal opinions on these maps and these cases, right? I think the encasements are truly impressive. They're just remarkable works of engineering. They're really pretty to look at. Uh, the ones at the library were, I, as far as I know, the largest in the world. Right? They are truly unique encasements. Um, it's this really lovely intersection of science and art, I think. And so, to be honest, I, I don't know what their future holds. I'm disappointed to see them go. Um, I'll miss them. Whenever I was working on them, there were always visitors interested in what we were doing. Right? And so, Jen mentioned it, right, that, that they did their work after hours, they have to close it up to get into the case. Fenella mentioned the door was small, you couldn't see inside. The library was in an interesting place where people could see what we were doing when we were doing it. And so I, you know, was doing work and we had a, a father and a son come by once and they saw me screwing around with plumbing and they said, what's going on in here? And I told them it was an inert case and they said, so, so you mean like nitrogen or argon? Which do you use? And what do you do with the pressure? Pro this is just public visitors who, who came and they knew what we were doing and they were emphatically interested. And so from then on, I kept the door open. Every time I was working on it, I made sure it was on a public day. I made sure that the visitors were open and I would start giving mini lectures when people were there, you know, if they were interested and, and visitors were passing by. And so I would continuously hear, I, we didn't even know the library did this. Who, who does this? You have scientists at the library? We didn't know that. And so I think it's a very remarkable visual representation, these cases, of sort of the attention and technical expertise that goes into library decision making, right? It adds that human aspect to what are otherwise just, just objects on a wall. They're not just, the declaration is not just. The, you know, the first map of America is not just. But it adds that human aspect. And so I, I'm telling you this, right, as kind of a report from the field, right? Um, I don't think anyone has seen that kind of interaction with the cases. I don't think anyone, I've, I've only been the only one ever over there doing that kind of work. Matt Coleman liked to do it after hours. Hans, when he would work, he liked to do it after hours or before visitors were there. Um, I got to see the people who were really interested in this, right? It engaged a subset of visitors and a subset of interests that I don't think get engaged very well with um, at the library. And so, right, we have these cases here, we have the experts here, that's an aspect of, of library work and library learning that we could use for visitor engagement, right? I, I was always excited to be able to do that. And so I think there's a case to be made that these cases, right, are historic objects in themselves, right? They're part of LC's, the library's infrastructure, um, much like the windows or the desks or the sconces, these were here for 15 years, right? This is a big deal. Um, you know, maybe you like the cases, maybe you don't, Maybe you point to them and you say, gee, I can't believe we used to do that, you know, if we, if we keep these around anymore. Um, but I think it's a teaching moment either way. I think they, they had a remarkable power to do that. Um, and so if we're looking for better ways to engage users with kind of preservation at the library, um, I'd argue that, that these cases are, are a pretty compelling one. And so I'm hopeful that something like them comes back in, in some form. And so that's where I'm gonna end my, my soapbox. Um, so if anyone wants to talk about that or, or any of the technical questions or talk to, you know, Jen or Fenella Moore, I think we're going to open it up for questions. Thank you. I just want to say I do believe once you hit the 15-year mark, you are termed no longer a newbie at the Library of Congress. And we'll, we'll repeat that question for the online. You had a question, sir? Uh, I'm not a chemist, and I'm not a paper con conservator, but I was one of the cartographic specialists in geography and map division as the Wallsey Miller map was being acquired. Now, hearing your res the results of your research or your investigation, 
what would be your recommendation now to the exhibits office and the folks in geography and map division about continuing to display the Walsen-Mueller map uh, and, and possibly also the Buell map? Because I know one of the conditions of buying the Walsen-Mueller map or acquiring the Walsen-Mueller map was that it would be on display. I don't know if that was the wisest decision at that time, but uh, what would be your recommendations? Do you want to tackle that one? <laughs> it's a wonderful question. Thank you. Do you and want to repeat it? I don't know. Did that get the up? the question was: uh, are there any uh, advice that we would give for? future exhibits of the Voltsmuller and the Buell, given that the, the part of the, uh, donation, the, the purchase and um, donation to the library was that they would be on some level of permanent exhibit. It's always a challenge when you're faced with a permanent exhibit question, and it's one that I'm looking at some of our conservation colleagues, it's like, oh my goodness, could, could we just not have to deal with this? I, I I think the research we've shown is that to be able to put something on exhibit for that period of time and see absolutely no change, which seemed weird when we first looked at it, but it's like, that's really cool, that's no, you know, that's an issue. Uh, the With the new galleries, that's changed the way um, some of the exhibits have been played out at the Library of Congress, uh, and I know that there's been reviews of the original documentation in terms of that long-term exhibit and what that meant. So. Portions of the Voltsmula are being exhibited uh, and uh, as part of that. And so I think we would love to say that if you do have an absolute requirement for long term and you're potentially going to put an item at risk, then that's clearly a consideration. Uh, but again, it's a, a little bit to what materials are being rotated. My understanding is that some of those materials are being rotated now as part of the long term exhibit. Um, but Happy to, to talk more with you about that. So. Mm -hmm. Would you like to add anything about your? No, I, I think that summarizes it well. My question is um, if you were going to do this again and had another 10 or 15 years ahead of you, what would you slip into the case or what test would you do? So the question was, if we had to do this, if we could do this again, if it was going to happen again, would there be anything that we would include in the case to assist with some of our analysis or what was happening? One of the things we had hoped to do was to put in like a tiny sensor, a little like um, quartz window that we'd be able to do real time colour differential. Um, that was going to create an issue in terms of the the leak, potential leakage aspect, um, so we didn't quite go with that, but I think now with some of the fibre optic options, that could very much be a case, uh, be a case, be, a, be an option. Yeah, I think something like that, monitoring something else inside, um, so fibre optics are measuring either the object, whatever was going in, or some sort of sacrificial material, some indicator, some canary in the coal mine, right, something that you knew would discolor both in anoxia and something that would discolor in air or under different light levels, you could put it in. The challenge is how do you get to it, right, um, without opening the whole shebang. Um, and so maybe there's space in a manifold you could tuck, some, but that's not get light, right? So there's, there's, there's challenges to doing that. And I think some of that improved technology would, would have to be carefully thought about. But something like that would be the interest in doing it again. Um, I think ensuring kind of plug and play sensors. Some of that sensor technology has improved tremendously since 2007, right? Um, I think would, would make life a lot easier if, just in terms of practical usage going forward. I'll add that the Charters of Freedom cases at the National Archives tried to use fiber optics and a quartz window, but because of the just and Fenella mentioned also like when you're bolting it down it really was important to bolt it in a certain order but even if you had different people on different edges of the encasement working around like a clock there still at these different times was going to be a little bit more stress on one spot than another and that meant that our quartz window no longer lined up. Even with all of the machining and all of the technical specifications, I mean, these cases 
are a engineering marvel but still just the okay i'm getting ready to torque this are you ready are you ready and you couldn't have somebody physically torquing each bolt at and even that might have been enough differential that the window doesn't work so we do need more advances and it would be wonderful if these windows did work because it would make our, our job more easy hopefully um but i do think andrew's point about having the backing paper and having that be a sacrificial sample is definitely not something to forget are there any lessons or maybe not lessons but can any of this research be applied to storage practices in any way So the question is whether this um, information or what the analysis and the work we've done, whether that can be applied to storage practices. There are, um, and a lot of it came from the textile industry, there are huge warehouses where they minimise, that was more so they didn't want all the fabric to go up in flames, but they, they reduced the oxygen level to around 16%. There's been some other work um, th that's looked at, whether a slightly reduced oxygen level actually has some pr uh, preservation impact there's different um, that's still ongoing research uh, but there are like these the Boston Spa at the National Library of uh, the British Library National Library and there are some other places who are, have reduced that oxygen level because it has does confer some long-term benefits so as Andrew was sort of alluding to looking at what that cutoff point for different materials might be um, is, is something that we would really love to keep working on I think the only, only other thought I'd have on that is something that we talk about in the white paper. Um, one of the white papers that we, we wrote was to say, you know, does this provide any, you know, insight into, into storage thoughts that like to your question is it really depends on what you're closing up. Right? It really, really depends. Um, if it's, you know, plastics, plastics composites, things that are kind of more modern that have a whole different host of concerns and probably would be a bad idea compared to something like maybe these maps. And so understanding the materiality of, of what that storage is for is really crucial. There's no like one size fits all. So it's hard to make a, a projection like that. We've got one, uh, we'll take one online and come back over here. All right, we have a host of online questions. I will just start with the one. Um, how often do you change your sensors? Not anymore. Um, <laughs> they're done. Um, so when they fail. Um, so we, we, we only change them when they fail. Um, we had... I would say most of the sensors failed, total failure, once in those 10 to 15 year ranges, right? So we had to replace the humidity sensor once. We had to replace the oxygen sensor we were about to before we learned that we were gonna deinstall the cases and we decided it was not a useful uh, expenditure of resources. We had to replace the pressure sensor once for a host of reasons, just things break, technology breaks. Um, and so each of those got replaced once in, in the lifetimes of the two library map cases. I don't know, what about yours? The Magna Carta humidity sensor is in the process of being replaced. Um, and um, NARA took a little bit of a different um, strategy where we don't monitor continuously. And so that may in some ways help us as the sensors aren't being used quite as frequently. And now, Andrew also, I think, makes a good point that having continuous live monitoring is really important. But when the charters were first encased, that really wasn't an option for us. And so therefore, I think we've seen a different aging of our sensors. And so it's really just been, knock on wood, the one sensor. But now I'm scared that I've answered that question. 
Next question. Um, for LOC, as the maps are now out of the encasements, how are they currently being stored? What conditions? And if they are be to be used in the future, um, how will they be displayed? I think I'm simply going to have to say that's um, outside our purview, uh, but we're happy to talk further about that. Another question. Um, how does anoxic or hypoxic environments help present, uh, prevent hydrolysis? I know, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to, to figure out how to do this concisely in, in 30 seconds. Um, if you want to talk more, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. I can. I can do that justice with a couple other questions waiting, and everyone probably really hungry. Sorry, that that feels like a dodge. It's not. Um, it's just a complicated answer. Yeah. Um, I guess this is really more of brought up about reciprocity, which for people who don't know, it's just the idea that the total amount you expose something to light will be the same whether you do intense light for a short time or low light for a long time. So we talk a lot about failure of reciprocity and I kind of wanted your opinion about that from the experience of all of this uh, experimentation and analysis after a pretty long time, right? Um, and I, I thought maybe that there had been some work done with doing light exposure, you know, the, um, um, microfading in anoxia or hypoxia to compare. So I wasn't sure about that. Um, and so if you could maybe address both, both, well, it's kind of one question. Yeah. It is kind of one question. Um, for anyone who couldn't hear, the, the question was about reciprocity, this idea of some of our tests, um, light testing and fade testing works on a different time scale. You're essentially delivering the same energy dose, but over different time and intensities. And mm -hmm. there's been some discussion in the literature, and, and Lynn wanted to know if there were any thoughts that, that we learned from this, as well as any testing that had been done of that type in hypoxia and anoxia. And so there's, to the, to the last point, there's been a handful of different studies since about, you know, mid-2000s on different hypoxic and anoxic fixtures and which types of colorants change differently under hypoxia and anoxia at different levels. Um, and so there is, there's work done on it at the lab scale. I don't think there's been much work done at this scale, right, at, of natural aging. There's been some under, like, fluorescent lights, which is Again, a little bit different than this time scale over a couple years. I've seen some Prussian blue work that's been done on a couple years. Um, but it's, it's very hard to make that comparison. But there is work that's being done, and I know there are people who are interested in it. Yeah, but you didn't do it. We, n n no, well, <laughs> yes and no. So Cindy did some work um, yeah, in preparation of this. So the answer, the answer from Cindy was that there were some mock samples that, that were made of some different pigments. Predict what you saw. Let me go read that report from 15 years ago. <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's such a complicated. That's the answer, is that it's, it's really yeah. hard to make a, any kind of projection like that here. Particularly right? with the different spectral power distribution between the lighting that these were exposed to in the encasement and what our test instruments do, it's a really different light source. And at the time, we didn't have the ability to do laboratory studies with LED light sources because we didn't have the LED tester. It all gets back to that question, that challenge of this is 10 to 15 years apart now, mm -hmm. right? The instruments changed, our detection methods have changed, our instrumentation available to us has changed. It's really hard to make some of those comparisons. There are more questions, but I know we are at time. Uh, five minutes. That clock is a little fast. Okay. 
Um, I will then continue with the questions. Can you share any information on the costs for acquiring and maintaining these cases? Just interested um, for comparing to normal cases. We did anticipate this question. Um, short answer is um, I came in when things had already been purchased, essentially. Um, I know some of our colleagues in GNM can possibly uh, share some numbers. Um, I think the long-term monitoring is a big aspect of it. Um, having a case that will actually be able to be sealed, uh, hermetically sealed, changes that from a, what you might call a normal case. Um, we, I'm afraid we don't have specific numbers because sometimes there's work in kind and there's interagency agreements, so we don't have a specific number to share with you. But I'm happy if you want to reach out and we can see you know, if that's something you're interested in, we can see what we can share. National Archives mentioned they wanted maybe a new case soon. What's the budget? <laughs> I don't okay, know okay, the okay. budget, so. <laughs> this person is very interested in thoughts about anoxic effects on the media, including Iron Gall Inc. Um, can any of the panelists speak more about this? Would Dr. France be able to talk about uh, protecting the Prussian blue on the Abel Buell map? How was it determined that 5% oxygen was an ideal level? Really good question. Um, and we were talking about this it happened just before one of our government shutdowns. Uh, so um, Cindy had been doing some testing and we'd been looking at different levels. We'd also looked at the literature and uh, this was how we came about that number. Um, it was very much a let's see what happens at different levels. So. We can talk a little bit more about that, but it was that was the existing research at the time and the testing that we had done to see what was actually going to occur to the materials. So that's how we came up with that number. I'll jump in for a quick 10 second addition and say that since those were in case, there have been a couple of studies as well that came out on specific oxygen levels with Prussian blue. And there interestingly is kind of confirming work that was done here, um, always nice to, to get confirmation, kind of an elbow in preservation of Prussian blue around four or five percent oxygen. Below that, it, it started struggling a little bit to, to retain that reversion um, and color protection. This person is interested um, in the volatile organics that we measured off the case. Um, they say, what level um, does acetic acid become a problem? Uh, again, yeah, we, we can we can talk offline, um, but there's um, always minimizing it. Is it's it's never a bad idea to minimize it. There, I mean, more acetic acid is never good. You, you you don't if you can get rid of all of it, that'd be great. Um, in terms of the actual kinetic rates of reaction of you know how fast acetic it gets complicated. Um, so there's no there's no great answer. For that, it again depends on how your material is structured and if it's layered and if it's where the acetic acid is stuck and is it ventilated. There's a lot of complicated things. Um, less is better, always. All right, this person is interested about the um, potential of uh, dust being an agent of deterioration. Um, they basically want to know, they talk about static attraction and the issue when people aren't wearing hair and beard and arm sleeves in some of the pictures. Um, can you talk to the uh, factor of dust being an agent of deterioration and how worried we were about that? There was uh, a very precise cleaning process. I. I'm looking at one of my wonderful conservation colleagues. I can't remember how many times this w this was cleaned through. And the challenge, of course, was that because it was such a huge event, we did have to have press and other people involved. So we were a little bit restricted with what we could do. We couldn't actually use a clean room. Um, we, the 
case itself was flushed out. Uh, we we did not detect any levels of that um, significantly or see any deposits uh, within the case. So it's, it's a really interesting question, um, but it would, you know, a lot of the images you saw were because we had press in the area at the time when we were trying to, to do that. So. So I uh, just want to thank you know, all the questions. I know we're a little short on time and it's a really complicated process and I just want to thank uh, Jennifer and Andrew for their wonderful presentations. We'd be very happy to follow up with you and share your contact information with colleagues if you have further questions. So please do uh, reach out to us at any of those emails and we'll be happy to follow up on those discussions. Again, huge thank you to those of you in the room and to all of you who joined us online.